All right, welcome everyone to today's Kelsey Museum virtual flash talk. For those of you new to this format, a flash talk is a brief presentation about a current research project, followed by a lengthy Q&A. Our presentation today should last about 15 minutes and then it will be, we'll have a 15 minute for questions with you, our audience. Please use the chat feature or raise your hand to ask questions um, and you can unmute yourselves at that time to, to ask your questions. Um, and finally, as you've heard, this event is being recorded and will be available on our website um, at a later date. Our speaker today is Kelsey Museum Research Scientist, Dr. Richard Redding. Uh, Richard is also the lead uh, archeologist on several research projects in North Africa, in the Middle East and in Asia. Uh, and he is the chief research officer for the Ancient Egyptian Research Associates. Today, he's going to be speaking to us about his current research project at Giza in Egypt. Welcome, Richard. Thank you, Kathy. I need you to enable my screen share. Oh, yes, I apologize. All right. You should be all set now. There you go. All right. Oh, that'll work. Well, hi everybody. Thank you for coming on uh, on today for this talk. I want to share this little quote. It's one of my favorite quotes in all of uh, the scientific literature. And Thomas, sorry, Thomas Huxley was once asked, "What was the nature of science? What was science?" And he said, "Science is." the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. And that's gonna be pertinent. That's kind of the entire uh, point of our little 15 minute presentation today. I should talk to you a little bit about, again, all of Kathy gave a great introduction. Uh, I've been working in Egypt since 1989. I started there on a couple of projects on my own. And then I became involved with Dr. Mark Lehner and he invited me to work with him on a project at the Great Pyramids. And I've been working there since 1989. The whole purpose of our project at the pyramids was trying to humanize them, trying to put people at the pyramids. People had always seen these monuments, these tombs, the temples, all the accoutrements of taking people to the afterlife. Nobody had ever found where the people lived who were involved in constructing all these monuments, and they had to be there somewhere. Huge numbers of craftsmen and builders and so on. So our whole thrust of the project starting in 1989 was to find where the people were. And indeed we did, we looked at a number of places, but if you look at this slide, there's the pyramids up there. Here's a modern Islamic cemetery. There's a Sphinx, you can see that right there. And this whole area down here is a site I've been working on since about 1989. It's called the Heta Garab, which means the wall of the crow. And it's named that because there's a large wall here, a big, long, big monumental stone wall, 10 meters high, 10 meters wide, uh, made of huge stones. In this area, though, is elaborate architecture. And this is probably what the area would have looked like during the Old Kingdom. There's a three pyramids. There's everyone's got a, a mortuary temple, a valley temple. Uh, we can't see the mortuary, well, there's a mortuary temple of Khufu, but we can't see the valley temple. An elaborate system of canals. And right here is the wall of the crow. And here is our site right here. You can see it's fairly large. It's a huge archeological site. It's about six hectares in size, uh, which is about six football fields. So about 200 meters by 300 meters for, so, for those who can work in, in meters. You'll see an area out here too marked as Cromer. I'm gonna briefly mention that later on in the talk. So here is a map on the left of the Hethagarab site. And you can see it's a very elaborate site. We've got these gallery sets, which have long and narrow rooms that are uh, 10 by 40 cubits long. They're 10 cubits wide by 40 cubits long. They were long, narrow rooms, which we believe were barracks, where people lived who were workmen. There's other areas in the sites. There's lots of 
construction areas for doing work. There's bakeries for making bread. There's breweries for making beer to feed the people. There's a large corral down at the bottom for holding the cattle that we were being brought in to feed the workers. There's a little place over here on the right called Eastern Town, which is a house that we excavated. And I've got a model of that house on the right of the screen. So you can see what it would have looked like. Uh, we also have the barracks. Here is one of the actual barracks we excavated. And you've got some of our workmen lying down there. You can see along the edge is a pillow shelf um, for your head. So this was where they all slept along here. There was a central uh, wall with columns that are held up a second floor. There's a door entrance down here. This is called Main Street out here. There were three streets, Main, North, and South Street. And the right is kind of a reconstruction of what this gallery complex is housing, this barracks for the workers probably looked like. Whoops, come on. Okay, sorry. Uh, here's another house that we've reconstructed that was in Western Town. This was actually the house somebody we know who lived here. His name was Shesha Nefer. And he was a high official under the Menkara, the, the man who built the third pyramid. This is his house. It's a monstrous house, probably around 400 square meters all in all. And very elaborate. There's cooking areas, there's areas for making bread, there's storage areas, there's a reception area. Uh, there's a private area for sleeping and other storage areas in the back. So this is site is very well documented, very large, very complex. Well, I've been working with animal bones since, believe it or not, 1967, I identified my first archaeological animal bone. It was from a site in Bay City, Michigan. Mostly, though, I've worked in North Africa and the Middle East. And in that I, don't know, I forgot to calculate the number of years. I don't think I want to calculate the number of years. But in that period of time, I've developed a methodology, kind of a, a way of attacking these huge quantities of bone to analyze them. And I've made a lot of assumptions about the way things are and the way things work that allow me to identify the bones and extract the data from them. And one of the assumptions I've always made, and here's a nice skeleton of a cow, is that the distal ends, these distal part of the feet, basically what the, we'd call our hands and our feet, uh, metacarpals and phalanges in front, metatarsals and phalanges in the back, these areas really aren't very useful other than making bone tools. There's not a lot on them. They're not great source of meat. I mean, why would you eat them when you have these huge chunks of meat in the body of the animal? So my approach has been, I used to call these things meat-bearing bones, all the scapula, the humerus, the radius, the ulna, things that had meat on them. And I called these distal limb elements non-meat-bearing bones. And I thought they made a great indicator of butchering because you'd take the animal, butcher it, those would be left over, you'd throw them in the garbage, you'd throw them in the trash, or you might take them to an area and use them to make bone tools. Most bone tools that we find on archaeological sites are made out of the metapodial bones, the metatarsals and the metacarpals in ruminants. They're very thick, they're very heavy, they make great bone tools. So I had this model of these bones were worthless. They weren't useful at all. Well, in 1918, 1918, 2018, sorry, um, 2018, I was working with a material from that site of Cromer that you saw in the hill, which was a giant dump. It was a huge, monstrous dump, probably three or four meters deep and an area of a football field. And it's filled with all the garbage that was left over, it was thrown away from a site. And we found a huge number of these animal bones you can see on the top. And one of the things you might notice that most of these animal bones don't have any ends on them. The other thing is you can see, there's one that was drilled. There's a metacarpal from a sheep that was drilled. And you can see on the lower right, a lot of these bones have butchering marks on them. They were heavily butchered to remove the meat. So I was somewhat surprised. I had never seen anything like this. And I was working with, at the time, uh, two colleagues, Mohammed Hussein in the back and Mohammed Rauf there in the front. And I was actually training them in archaeozoology. And this is in our lab at Giza. And you can see all our comparative material there. And we all the other broken bone we're trying to identify there. 
And I asked the two guys, I said, Muhammad and Muhammad, what do you think about all this? What do you, what do you think's going on here? Because it was very curious to me. And they looked at each other and they said in unison, Kawada. I said, Kawada, what is Kawada? That's Kawada. Kawada is a, a dish in, in the Arab world. It's boiled feet of cattle, sheep, and goat. And they cut the ends off and they boil the bone. And on the right is a pot with a boiled distal um, metacarpal of a cow in it. You see some tendons and cartilage stuck on it. And it's a dish that's boiled up, sometimes with a little bit of vegetables in it, and eaten. And it's really very, it's considered to be a very nice dish. People eat it, they love it. There's restaurants that specialize in it. I had never been one to, to one before. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Whoops. <coughs> I went to one. And this is a picture that was used in the advertising. And that basically is a, uh, a cow foot there. These are the hooves right down here, these little tiny white bones. That would be the metacarpal or the metatarsal right here. And it's all covered with, even the hoofs were on there and had been heavily boiled. So it was all the cartilage and the uh, marrow from the bones, from the feet, marrow out of the phalanges, uh, all the connective tissue all right there. Well, I started looking into Kawara and I found that Kawara is probably one of the most, if you're doing heavy labor, it is probably one of the most, the best dishes you can possibly eat. First of all, the dish is composed as you saw, bone marrow, it's got healthy fats in the liquid, the collagen, which is dissolved in the liquid and cartilage which becomes soft and dissolved into the liquid. For 100 grams of serving, that's three and a half ounces, it has 519 calories. So to get 519 calories in what probably is the fattiest, heaviest meal you could have in the United States right now that I can think of like for comparison, a Big Mac has 530 calories, but it weighs 200 grams. So this is the same amount of calories packed into 100 grams as you would get in a Big Mac but it's got lots of good things in it. There's 20 grams of protein in that 100 gram serving. There's 65.5 grams of fat. There's amino acids rich and it's including glycine, proline and glutamine. Some of the basic amino acids your body really needs. It's filled with minerals, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium and potassium. The minerals that are critical to bone growth, uh, intra plant, uh, impulse transmission in the nervous system, regulating the heartbeat, uh, building muscle and doing muscle contractions. In fact, uh, uh, magne magnesium is involved in over 300 biochemical reactions in our body. So again, this is extremely rich in nutrients, omega-3 and anti-inflammatory and lin linoleic acid. It's filled with chondroitin, which people now take the pills of to help their joints. It's got, I should mention something, the in animals, um, oleic acid is, is the, one of the acids uh, that is found in fats. And oleic acid is the, uh, what makes olive oil taste good, oleic acid, olive oil. And in animals, the further you go out in the limbs from proximal to distal, the further you get out away from the humerus, the radius ulna, down to the hands and the fingers, the higher the content of oleic acid. So the fat and um, uh, in the hands and feet actually tastes better than the fat in the marrow cavities of the arm and the leg. So this is just a powerhouse of a meal. So um, suddenly I realized that there was a lot to this, that koala really was important and an important source of nutrients and it's just an ideal food for workers. So I went back to my faunal data that I had done for these years. And I wanted to look at this. Could they have been eating kawara? Now I doubt they were eating exactly what we call kawara today, but were they boiling 
distal limb elements of cattle and sheep and goat and consuming them to get all these wonderful nutrients? Could they have been a major food for people who were doing lots of physical labor? So I went back and I looked at the barracks fauna that I had done uh, and actually done in the year 2000 and published in 2000. And I had always been bothered by this, but I, when I predicted one before I even started looking at the faunal data from the galleries or the barracks, I expected to find lots of sheep and goat and no cattle because sheep and goat were a poor person's food in ancient Egypt. Cattle were the luxurious food. And I was quite surprised that when I got to the actual faunal data and analyzed it, I found 530 sheep and goat bones and only 59 cattle bones. That's a ratio of 8.9 sheep and goat bones for each one cow bone. But I thought that was really high. What were all those cattle doing there? And in fact, when you consider the fact that one cow or bull or calf contributes 10 times the amount of edible product as a uh, sheep or goat, then 8.9 to one, that means they're relying equally, you would think, on sheep meat and cattle meat. And I was very surprised by this. Well, with my knowledge about, my new knowledge about Kawara, I went back to that fauna assemblage. I looked at it, I looked at it in close detail, went back to the original list, and I found out those 59 cattle bones, 90.1% of them were the bones from Kawara. So indeed, the people in the barracks were eating a lot of sheep and goat. And that's where you found the humerus and the meat from sheep and goat. But they were eating a lot of kawara. They were eating boiled feet of cattle. So this really was an enlightenment to me. I've had to back off entirely of my idea of, of uh, meat bearing and non-meat bearing and now see these distal limb elements as important in the whole subsistence system that involved the pyramids and pyramid construction. And indeed, I started looking at, at some of the other sites I've done in Iran, Iraq, Syria, Turkey, uh, trying to look at were these people also doing these kinds of things. So what are my lessons? My lessons, I always like to have lessons. We're often blinded by our assumptions. I think Alan Alda uh, gave a lecture at a, or a, a graduation speech at a college in upstate New York, and he quoted, made, gave a quote about we are often all blinded by our assumptions. We need to take them out periodically and scrub them down and look at them carefully. That's true. We really need to be careful about our assumptions and we should be constantly rechecking them. We are often blinded, blinded by our cultural experiences. My, with my Midwest palate, I had never thought about going to a Kawara restaurant and eating Kawara in Egypt. I've eaten a lot of things I've, that were off the chart uh, in my experiences in the Middle East and Africa but I had never had Kawara. And you really need, we really tend to be blinded by our cultural preferences, our cultural experiences. And the third lesson, and this may be one of the most important of all, is recording all the data one can when analyzing material culture, even if it's unrelated to what we're interested in, all the research questions we're trying to ask. And then archiving it for the future is one of the duties of every archeologist, because if you don't have the data on hand, you can't go back and re-examine it. And if you didn't take the data in the begin with, it's lost. We have to be very careful about trying to uh, extract all the data we can from the material culture, which is one of the reasons we spend a lot of time measuring, recording, identifying, taking photos of absolutely everything in our field. So with that, I would like to thank you for your 15 minutes and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, I'll open this up to our audience to ask any questions. Uh, feel free to type it in chat or raise your hand and uh, we can un unmute yourselves and ask your questions. Do we know how much, uh, what, uh, how can I say this? Uh, how much meat these workers got, be it sheep or goat versus how much plant? Uh, yeah, I've actually cal calculated that, uh, that they, given a number of estimates, I've approached it several ways. I approach it one, by calculating the minimum number of animals that were being consumed 
and looked at how much meat they yield, divided that by the number of workers, which we have estimates for the number of the workers. And it turns out that they're eating about 300 to 350 grams of meat a day, uh, which is a good, a good chunk of meat. It's not, it's like having steak every night, but pretty close. So it's a pretty good chunk of meat that they're eating day, every day. And that doesn't include the fish because they have no way to quantify fish. I've never, I've tried. So that's exclusive of fish and they were eating a lot of fish. Now they also ate bread and uh, we, they, they ate a lot of bread, they drank beer and they had onions and garlic and probably some other greens. They had lettuce also on the, uh, on the diet. Um, so they had a really good diet. The person I work with who's an archaeobotanist, Claire Mallison, has done similar, similar calculations and I wasn't really prepared to talk about these measurements but they were probably getting about 3,000 calories a day in their diet with the bread. We know what their bread ration was, we know what their beer ration was. We also know the, uh, uh, as I said, the meat ration. So we've got pretty good estimates and, and about 300, 335 grams, I think my calculation. So what happened to all the, the cattle hooves were there to make kawara? Uh -huh. um, who was eating the good part of the cattle? Oh, well, by the good part, that's my cultural. <laughs> yeah, yeah, your cultural norm. That's actually an interesting story. And yeah, it, the cattle, um, I found what I, I call the cattle perch complex at Giza. Cattle and perch seem to be correspond to each other. When cattle goes up, perch goes up at a site or an area of the site. When cattle go down, sheep and goat go up, perch go down and catfish go up. So cattle and perch are related. Why perch? Perch is the most desirable fish in the Nile. It's a fish that's, the meat is very good. It's not excessively oily. It has a little bone in it. Uh, they come in huge quantities. Uh, some of the Nile perch weigh up to 200 pounds. Oh. So they're impressive fish. And what we found is that, remember that a lot, the elite house that I showed you in Western town? Yes that we, I thought was occupied probably by a man named Sheshenefer. That is where we get a lot of cattle and almost no sheep and goat, almost no sheep and goat. We get cattle, we get young cattle, veal, in lots of numbers. We get uh, some wild animals, we get a zell, which is uh, an addix and oryx, which are wild animals that were hunted. Um, and we get almost no sheep and goat that it might as well not even be there. Uh, there's an area that was called the, the, uh, the uh, guard house inside the complex at Giza, inside the barracks. And it's a separate structure that was very large that sat right at the gateway and probably was a control point. Those people got cattle, they were probably higher ranking individuals, got cattle and perch. Uh, everybody in Western town got cattle and perch. So, uh, and cattle were offerings. And again, I, it, gets, it just goes on and on. I didn't tell you this, but in Western town, when I looked at the cattle, that almost all the cattle are the hind limbs. They're all hind limbs. They're eating meat from the back of the animal, the femur, the tibia, the pelvis. Uh, they aren't eating the forelimbs. We find almost no forelimb bones in Western town. And why is that? If you go to offering texts, they always offer the forelimb, if you look at the, and I, again, I don't know if I can pull up a slide of this, but the forelimb is always offered. And you see this in all the tomb carvings. It's always the forelimb being offered, not the hind limb. So I predicted that if, if we, since the people in the Western town were getting the leftovers of the offering cattle, the hind parts, that if ever we found a priestly precinct, a priest, that's where all the forelimbs of cattle would be. And actually that's come to fruition. We found those areas and we found that the samples in the priestly deposits are always very biased towards forelimbs. So, I mean, it's, it's a story that just goes on and on and you can play with the nuances, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We have a couple of questions in the chat. The first is since over 90% of the cattle bones were kawara bones, might there be a remainder of cattle uh, have been how, where might the remainder of cattle have been used? Ooh, sorry about that. That's, that's exactly right. And that would have been, 
um, in the Western town in offerings and so on. So they would uh, slaughter the, the cattle and the, they would then would disperse it. And the forelimbs would go for offerings, the hind quarters and the rest of that, that part of the body uh, would go to the Western town and to the more higher ranking individuals. And the feet would go into the barracks. They would just send the feet into the barracks, which they would plop it into a big pot that they had boiling in the back of the barracks. There's a kitchen in the back of every barracks with evidence of boiling. And uh, they would pop, plop it into the big pot there and stew it up. And they would eat at least two meals in the barracks. They'd eat the meal in the morning before they went to go to work on the pyramids, uh, which would be from this big stew pot, would probably include kawar and fish and maybe other cuts for sheep and goat. They would then uh, go out to the site to work and they'd probably eat on site. They would probably, if they left, they got their beer and bread rations for lunch. And they probably got some meat rations, either dried meat or dried fish for eating on the site for their lunch. Then they come back at sunset and they'd have their evening meal again out of the big stew pot in the back. Question answered? Yeah. Thank you. And our second question is, the drawing of the two-story building shows Roman arches. Did Egyptians of that era have those? Oh, yes. Uh, it's one of the things not well known. Uh, those arches, arching, the oldest arches in the world are probably at our site in Giza. Uh, and we, we pretty sure that's the case, not because we found them, because the architectural, the walls between each gallery is a meter and a half. Plus you had those, uh, well, and that's much too wide uh, for a regular wall that only went one floor. Plus the fact that the architect we said that we had working with at the time, a German, said that that kind of a width would only be used for a vault to go over. So we're talking really about it, not so much an art as a drum vault going all the way the length of the structure. And the Germans working at uh, Dashur, um, where the Bent Pyramid is and the Red Pyramid, which are actually earlier than ours at Giza, actually have found in the, uh, um, they excavated the, Valley Temple of, uh, the, of Sneferu who built the Red Pyramid and found a uh, corridor leading from the Valley Temple down to the, um, um, the harbor where the goods were brought in. And that corridor was a vault, uh, a vaulted arch. Uh, the mud brick was still intact. They were able to excavate it. And they had about 15 or 20 meters of, of vaulted arch still intact. So yes, they were making arches out of mud brick in the old kingdom in Egypt. Hey, thank you, Richard. And then we have a third question, which I think you've sort of partially answered, but uh, where was the food prepared? Uh, in central kitchens or individually? And where did the people eat in a large dining room or what? Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, it's, this is kind of a two-part question. You saw that I showed you the big corral down at the bottom on the first uh, slide. I think I showed that to you. And so all the animals were brought down there and they were accounted for. Then they were dispersed to the site. Probably the sheep and the goats went directly live to the galleries and they were butchered live in the galleries. So each gallery got one or two sheep or goat per day that they butchered live and put the, into their stew pot. The cattle, uh, were probably set, taken to um, an area that was close enough that uh, the offerings could be made and then the rest of the animal be dispersed from there. So there may well have been a, a, a central area for butchering the cattle and a decentralized system for butchering the sheep and goat. Now, how do we know that? Okay. Um, we've done an analysis of, of, remember I showed you those butchering marks on the bones? And those nice butchering marks. Um, we did an analysis of the cut marks on those bones. And all the cattle bones were butchered using a bifacial knife. Uh, we have these beautiful long knives that are flint, bifacial, um, that are common in the old kingdom of Egypt. Beautiful, spectacular pieces of, of stonework. 
those are what were used to butcher the cattle. And you also see that in all the tomb scenes when they're showing butchering. Boy, I wish I could pull up the slide of that, of them butchering in the tomb scenes using these stone knives. But all the sheep and goat bones were, all the sheep and goat were slaughtered and cut up with knives that were unifacial blades, only one-sided, not two-sided. So there's a total different set of tools being used on the sheep and goat than being used on the cattle. Well, great, thank you very much. Are there any final questions? All right. Well, thank you so much, Richard. That was really fascinating. And thank you all to our audience for coming out and uh, virtually to, to hear our talk. Uh, I will remind you guys that our next flash talk will be July 9th at noon. Dr. Laura Mazza will be speaking about the uh, Tiber River. The title of her lecture is Once Upon a Time There Was a River, The Environmental History of the Tiber Valley Before Rome from the Neolithic to the Iron Age. Please join us next month. And thank you again, Richard. And thank you all for coming. I enjoyed it. It was wonderful.